even if you make a really shit timing, it's such a good exercise because like it, like you said, you know, we want to go over your thinking of it and it's, it's just going to be such a good learning experience for our understanding and looking at, you know, hey, how do we make a decision? And that's kind of step one of a very many um, path step of like really understanding the game on a, on a good enough level and especially in terms of not like, do I need to understand the game as deeply as Serral and have his mechanics as well as his understanding? No, but it's enough to um, steer your direction to keep the game fun, to uh, steer the game away from situations that you don't enjoy. That's the, you know, everyone has certain game states they just don't excel in and they don't enjoy that much. You know, whether that be a really aggressive all-in game or a really turtly game. But, you know, you're just going to be expanding your knowledge to kind of say, hey, okay, I've been greedy. Let's find a timing attack somewhere a few minutes after that greed has kicked in where we can take the fight to our opponent, leverage it, and, and you know, really see if it's going to uh, pay off. And sometimes you'll make some mistakes because, you know, you'll come up with something that's maybe very internally um, coherent, right? It's like this just lines up. It seems like a nice timing attack. It seems good. And it, it, maybe it is and you've optimized what you're doing, but maybe in the meta... Um, uh, all the Protoss players are massing Immortals on two base. And so, you know, going for a two and a half base, just Roach timing, just happens to be bad in the current meta. So you, you've still figured out something good. You've come up with a good build that lines up well with like plus one and Roach speed kicks in and you, your Roaches go off 55 drones and it's this beautiful attack. But, you know, it just happens that for some reason the meta build this month, it, it kind of hard counters this blindly, right? And and we need to come up with a bit of a plan B. But hopefully it's like either way, it's a good learning experience and it allows us to look at lining things up in regards to our build order being efficient and then transitioning our economy into an army and, and really focusing on that before an attack. But then also thinking on the other hand about how it interacts with what our opponents are doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, to, to the ZVZ point, and I, I, I hear what you're saying on the ZVP, and um, I'll, I'll discuss that kind of when we get to that in a little more detail. But this is yeah. this is my my sharpest timing yet, where all the pieces kind of came together. Um, normally, the part where I kind of screw up this build is my baneling nest is at most four seconds late, so like 255, 257. Um, but the banelings are still morphed as soon as the baneling nest is finished. I usually have four Zerglings hidden across the map, and my attack always goes out right on time at 3.45. So I'm, I'm starting to keep things a little bit more hidden, and unfortunately, due to poor Overlord placement, my opponent didn't see this until it was it was way too late. Which is really common, right? Because you're here. You're setting up your Overlords really nicely right now. Looks like you're going to have pretty much 100% vision once this uh, second Overlord finishes getting in position, which is obviously, you know... Nothing could be happening yet. You've seen it's hatch first, so it's not like there's going to be lings flooding out with lings feed yet. So this is like, look, just look at the, oh, your overlord positioning is making me really happy, mate. You're even checking the pillar above your natural. And his overlord positioning is what you see from most players, even sometimes in GM. And it's, yeah, it's shit. Yeah, he started to start the overlord in the back. I actually worked out where I'm going to place the overlords in all the maps. It didn't take too long to do, but just so I know where it is, so I don't have yeah. to think about it anymore. Um, and then I, I have like five benchmarks that I hit like speed at 210, hatch at 237, baneling nest at 253, um, morph banelings as soon as it's done, so it's 335, and then the attack at 345. And if I, I give myself like a two second window, so if it's yeah. two seconds late, I'm still on time. And on this one, it came together just nicely. I mean, dude, I, I can, I, I'm almost saying like that's almost even too harsh on yourself, but it's clearly paid off that level attention to detail, dude. Because oh, yeah. this no, is, I, I took, I took out a D1, uh, or well, a masters, master, low masters on on the EU server. I actually have the the mirror matchup. We played the exact same build, and uh, the sharpness really kicked in. That sharp cheddar, man. Very nice, dude. Ah, oh, unfortunately, we did run into a baneling with our first lings there, as we were. Oh, and we did, funnily enough, we messed up control grouping our eggs in that we didn't control click. So we're building a few more lings here and we're adding them to our control group. We didn't control click because we got lava on our hotkey. Doesn't really matter in this situation. And if there was ever a moment where it's like, hey, probably more important to micro the lings and the banes, I guess this was it, right? And we've yeah. taken objectively bad fights at the start, but your timing is crisp, your reinforce is solid. And this is exactly what I love to see because your what, what we see here is a really solid foundation. And all that matters, honestly, is like 
what can we add here is like, oh, okay, let's make sure we focus on those first guys as they go in a little bit more, right? So don't be caught still macroing when your lings run into the natural. Either don't build those last lings, or what I would do is probably just wait a little bit longer with those zerglings, even if we pause outside the base. Um, unless we have like one zergling way in front of the other zerglings, basically just, just a slight timing adjustment in terms of like, you know, not running into banelings while your screen isn't on center and you're, uh, and you're kind of uh, still control grouping. Yeah, for sure. This is this is game four out of the uh, nine or so games that I played this build on. Uh, I mean, I played about maybe like 13 or so games of CVZ over the last week. And yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of them I got 12 pooled and I kind of tried to work out a defense on that one. So thank you to some of the guys at Big Pan for, for helping me out with that. Legends. But this is this is one of the sharper timings along with game number seven in that mirror matchup on, on the EU server. Awesome. So... We could be rallying a few more of these lings in. What I love though is you're you're making banes and you're control grouping them steadily. Like we talked about this, I think, last week, where it's like, hey, I was like, just use your control group. And we were like, sometimes you'll accidentally morph banes at home. It happens. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> is it perfect? No, but it is such a minute thing. The fact that you've been so steady at morphing banes and control grouping them is really beautiful. And I mean, your opponent's just getting overwhelmed here. Um, technically, they had almost a wall and they had queens and banelings, this should have been an easy defense if they played perfectly. And yet they had great baneling hits on your first zerglings and banes. They had like a two for four baneling trade. They had a baneling kill like 14 lings or something like that. Still can't defend it because it's just, look at how incessant this wave is. And what's so what I love about this is, is honestly, dude, what you've done here is this is like, I, I want this to be like the manual for like the next time someone's going, no, it doesn't work, you know. Um, because like you've, you've actually messed up so much in the fighting and even pros mess up so much in the fighting, but your actions are never freezing up and going, yeah, shit, I've read it to a baneling. It's like, there's more banelings morphing. There's more zerglings building. Your queens are injecting. There's more zerglings morphing. There's more banelings morphing. The banelings are always clicked into the mineral lines so that they're automatically go like going in. There's just this constant stream and your opponent just cannot keep up because they're watching the fight. They're staring at you. Oh, what's happening? Oh, try to move a queen. Try to move a baneling. Try to move a zergling. Try to move the drones. And you're there dictating when things happen. And it just really like I, the attention to detail on hitting your timing. But then even once the fighting starts, the fact that you've kept your composure and you've kept macroing, this is exactly what we want to see. This is fantastic, mate. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually quite proud of this. I do, you should be this. I do have a couple of questions on some of the yeah, things yeah. I've seen. Um, there was in, in game number seven. Mm -hmm. um, should we go look, at, we that look at that one? Sure. Let's go do that. This this was the sharpest timing I've ever hit. It was actually ahead of all of my benchmarks by a second or two. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a good hold. I ended up losing this one. And the reason was because they had a spine in their defense, which I believe you call an anchor. Promote to lobby host. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering, like, since that, since that happened, I was like, no, it's nothing wrong with my build. I still had the exact 26 drones. Everything was on time. Everything was mm -hmm. nice and crisp. But I'm now thinking if I see a, a spine, my gut reaction is I'm going to take that sucker out immediately because mm -hmm. looking back on this, I lost way too much of my reinforcements to that spine. So awesome. I mean, I love that you're already drawing a conclusion there. Um, yeah, Bane? The correct conclusion or a good yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll take a look at it and, and kind of see. Um, queens and spines both can act as an anchor, right? So if they have like a spine and three queens, because the whole point is it's just like Ling Bane versus Ling Bane the spine or the queens it's just their ranged damage and they could just pick off banelings you know as they come in spread out so efficiently whereas like defensive ling bane well your banelings are only good if the aggressor runs in in a big clump right that's that's like their strength whereas the spines and the queens if you have a few banelings with them so the opponent can't just bum rush over the spines and the queens the spines and the queens can just pick off the units endlessly right that's why if we think about technically what is the correct response to a, a baneling run by and what could you, what could your opponent have done in that last game well, the thing is, even though you ran in in a clump, he actually should have been really, really careful, right? In terms of letting his banelings blow up. What should your opponent have done in that last game? Number one, when I see lings coming, and this is the same if I'm macroing, same if I'm being all in, doesn't matter, right? Grab all my queens, put them on my defense key, bring them to the natural, right? So if I even just two queens, it's just grab the queen from the, the, the main 
add it to the, the defense key, queen from the natural defense key, get him to the front and then try to get more Zerglings out. And why do I get more Zerglings out? Because I need to always have Banelings alive, right? Because the moment I don't have Banelings alive as the defender, the Lings, the Banes can flood in all at once and suddenly they don't have to come in spread out, right? They don't have to come out in a line. So my job is the Queens are just gonna stand up the front and just pick off units basically for free. And my Banelings are just gonna dance in circles around those Queens and just zone out the incoming Lings and Banes. But if at any point, all the Banelings are gone, bam, 20 Zerglings can just surround the Queens and kill them. Banes can just run in in a clump, click on the spine crawler, only takes like four banelings to kill a spine. It's not that hard. Just click on it and then they can run into the worker line. So it's kind of interesting to think about how if some, it, like, like when I play against a, a pro, you know, player and I try to do a ling bane pressure like this and it's kind of laughable sometimes because they're so quick to pull their queens to the front. They never let the banelings blow up unless I run like 15 zerglings into it. And I'm like, set your banelings off on these four zerglings, please. And the banelings just run around behind the queens in a circle. And I <laughs> can't even get a single baneling kill with four zerglings. And I'm like, just let me in, you know, be disorganized like most players on the ladder are. And you see them like methodically like, okay, I'm going to drop a roach horn to add to my evo and baneling nest. And one queen will monitor the wall. And then I'll, I'll move my anchor over to make sure the third survives as well. And I'm like, oh, this is just so perfect and methodical. And it's always good to look at and think about, hey, okay, so because we're just doing an attack, right? This is obviously not the most perfect play, just doing a giant Link Bane all in. Otherwise, we'd see it in every pro game. Um, thinking about kind of what can defend it, what their perfect response is. But on the other hand, if you are able to take even a bit of an inefficient trade, right? Say you get there, there's only one Bane Link and some Queens. If you even sacrifice 10 Zerglings to just kill the, the Bane Link, even though it, that's inefficient, if that then allows your next 20 Zerglings to immediately surround the Queens and kill them in the next few seconds, it's worth it, right? Yeah, for sure. So that's kind of something that you can start to think about in, in, in those terms. Um, um, okay, so this one, yeah. I saw the wall, I saw the spine. Um, I, I I just remembered your your words last time. I was like, what if I do for C wall? So I just bust it. And I was like, okay. I looked up the amount of Banelings. It's 11 Banelings for a, an Evo chamber, five for a spine crawler. And um, I was like, well, okay, time to bust this wall down. And it worked with some degree of success. Um, Small just tip. the follow-up was not quite what it needed to be. No worries. Dude, honestly, your opponent did a really sick build order. What's your MMR right now? Has it changed? Yes. It went up to 3.6 and then went right back down to 3.3 three because I was a little tilted and tired that evening and I just went on a losing streak. So I'll get back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm going to add a little update here. I'm going to say... Uh, April 1st, obviously it's, I know it's March 31st for you, but I, and then it, so it's just in the top of the document every now and then we'll just add like a little MMR update. Um, and we can add that next time as well. Um, your opponent had really sick macro, dude. Like, I, I don't know what to say other than the fact that your opponent here just played like the sickest, sickest early game. Like you shouldn't be able to kill a player who's done this well unless they really screw up. I just want to go back and appreciate that for a moment because I really want to point out how freaking crisp this opening was from your opponent, okay? Yeah, they were also very greedy. Like they built a lot of drones. And even in the middle of this pressure, you'll see them continue to build drones, which I was very confused at. Which this is, so this is a lot of game. Right? Like if I take away, if I take off that, that spine crawler, because yeah. um, that was the one thing that saved him. If if I took away that spine crawler, then he's gone. This player, this is this is a ladder game, not a custom game, right? Correct. Yeah, because your opponent is playing like they're map hacking. Yeah, I'm pretty certain they're either ma yeah, they're either map hacking, or they do the exact same thing every game. But this, so basically, he's he's seen the mass circling in production in his production tab hack. And he's now thrown down a, a full Evo wall, a Roach Horn, and a Spine, and pulled his Queens to the front. So this could just be an exceptionally safe player. Um, and to be fair, their droning in production is so good and their macro is so good that that's what makes me hesitate to say it's a hacker because a hacker would probably be more uncoordinated. But notice, once again, another player with trash overlord positioning, your opponent, has no vision of your lings leaving the base at all. So what you're playing here is a lucky baboon or a cheater. Um, or maybe they're, they're not a baboon. Maybe that's insulting, but... To not have an overlord outside the base is like literally 101 of ZVZ. And your opponent by, by default though is gonna have a spine and four queens ready. You are fucked. This player played so exceptionally safe. They didn't even leave a hole in the wall with a queen in it. This player went for a complete Evo wall off, Roach Warren in the back, and they've got a spine and four queens. Now, keep in, in, in mind, most of the time when you go up against a Gasless Wallen, they don't have a spine, or if they do, they've only got two queens. To have 
four queens they could bring to the front and transfuse already saved up and a spine finish and you can't even kill the roach warren because it's behind the wall and look at their drones they've already saturated two mineral lines and they're going up to three gas they have hit their droning perfectly they have really hit a super tight build order. This player, and maybe they're just playing safe. I don't know, right? I, I, I'm kind of like, holy crap, because they're not really scouting too much. Though I guess, you know what? They did see a Baneling Nest early, actually. Ah, okay. So why did we let them see that Baneling Nest? That's, that's the big mistake here. Okay. So you let two Zerglings just waltz into your base. Okay, okay, okay. So hot little tip here. Real simple. Always, with that queen out front, try to make sure you're in front of the Zerglings. Notice your queen's like, just a little too far forward. And then try to bring your other queen to the ramp if you can. Um, so that you can hopefully kill them before they see the Baneling Nest. Um, if you here just shuffled that queen to the right just slightly, those Zerglings would have just derped on the queen in between the gap between the pool and the hatch. And she would have killed both of them. And they wouldn't have seen the Baneling Nest. Because you see, if you click on the Zerglings and press vision, their vision sucks. Zerglings have very low vision. Nowhere near like an overlord or anything like that. Um... Do try to deny that scouting if you can. Um, does it really matter that much? Not necessarily, but since you're hiding the Baneling Nest in the back, it would make a difference because I think this is probably the one read where your opponent's like, I'm going to play mega safe because this guy's making a Baneling Nest and it's hidden in the back. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I can certainly work on that. Cool. I, I think at this, at this point, I was still trying to just get the build in my head, but yeah, that'll be my next point of... It's, it's such a small detail, bring the queens over. And the thing is, they still might like get past with the red point circling. So something that actually, I actually, you know, I'm going to go over that one more time. I, because there's a little detail I that I do. And it actually massively ups the percentage of being able to block it. Because most of the time, I'm too lazy to try to do like a queen plus a drone on hold position. Sometimes I'll do that on the ramp. I'll put, I'll bring the queen from the main to the ramp. And like a rallying drone, I'll just hold position next to it. And the Zergans can't get past if you position those two correctly. But what I find is, is an easier thing to do. Check this out. So if you look at the angle the Zergans are coming from, right? So in this case, you see it from the right. So what I often will try to do is I'll try to get them stuck on a corner. <laughs> so what I mean by that, right? So... Is if like, I think they're going to head towards my main or something. Say, say they're coming from the, the far right. It's, it's a little hard in this scenario. Let, let's imagine they were coming from the left. So imagine those Zergans are running from, do you see where I signal? Yes. So imagine they're running from that gas, guys. I would go right up to the edge, but I'd leave a tiny gap between my queen and the, 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 little, the little edge of the wall. And then like, as the Zerglings move, towards that gap i'd like shuffle to the left just slightly so the lings would kind of try to squeeze between my queen and the wall and you can you can open up on the stream as well by the way just to i get do it. have the stream open oh you've got it are you looking at it yep all right cool cool so yeah if you have the queen like here and the zerglings try to run down into this little gap and then you just shuffle the queen to the side to block it and the zerglings sometimes will just get stuck because they're like I, I i know i can fit through here but they can't like if you do it perfectly they just can't quite so they'll just like literally just headbutt against the queen in the edge and both just get themselves killed otherwise they have to go around and basically that queen will kill one zergling and get a hit off on the other one and then likewise if my other queen has come down by that point zergling's running towards the main I'm going to try and put that queen on the inside of the ramp, right? Because then the Zergling has to go around. And once again, I could do the same sort of thing where I put the queen like right on the corner of the bottom of the ramp and the Zergling's like, oh, can I get through here? No, I can't. And then, he, then he's got to go do, 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 and run up the bottom side of the ramp. And if you just get one more hit off or two more hits, usually it does mean a dead Zergling. Real minute stuff, not high priority, just a cool detail to talk about. Very good. Thank you. All right, let's go. So, uh, like I said, you're, you're screwed. Um, your opponent happened to play the most ultimate safe build of all time. So all we can talk about, though, is theory, which is, do you just go or do you wait for more units? So when I said bust the wall, what I usually mean is just rally lings into it and just start breaking it straight away. Blow some banelings up on it if you need. If you're blowing up a proper wall like this, you need to always save a baneling to basically detonate the moment the building dies because you got to get rid of those broodlings. Otherwise, they'll actually do a lot of damage to your zerglings um, and slow them down a lot. Uh, the problem is, in this case, there's already two queens and a spine doing damage behind the wall. So this is very different to normally if you just immediately rally onto the wall, right? There's like maybe two queens, one or two queens hitting you. And they might not even have the second queen in position in time. So the thing is, like, if you did commit right onto it, you can see if this spine was even 10 seconds slower, because, like, it's finishing now, right? But if this spine was even 10 seconds slower, 
you'd, I would say just keep attacking the wall right now with your Zerglings. And I would wait with the Banelings until the wall is a bit closer to dying. I wouldn't. And, and even when you do get in, you kind of want to have at least one or two Banelings, like I said, to not just blow up the Broodlings, but then also when the drones pull to fight to take them out as well. Now, you, now, I you think know, by I did, massing, I did sorry, test that out before. Um, uh, two Queens will, will, with a full wall of three Evos, um, the wall will get taken down by like 16 Zerglings. And I don't have to worry about the too many losses. So I at least dispelled that fear just with the unit tester thing. Awesome. Good, good move, dude. Yeah, because like, it, it feels really bad, right? But if they're not actually building like roaches or something at the same time, that's, you know, going to give them a better follow-up. They're either just continuing to drone, being greedy, or they're building like slow Zerglings. Obviously, if they build extra layers of Evos, that's pretty good. But look at this, dude. So you've run in. So this is a, a sort of situation where running in was the right call. Do you know why? Dude, there's like there's so much transfuse. Just look at the amount. Because he's, oh, I guess it's only one. But you don't have a full surround, even if you were to fight the spine. And all your lings are so damaged. And the drones could have pulled to fight you as well. So I, I, I think running into the main was the right call here. The only thing is, this is where we need to do something really advanced, which is stop our rally entering the base. So it's, it's yeah. really tough to do. So there's a few different techniques in this scenario if we've been control grouping the eggs, which you have. One thing you can do is basically just take your Zergling hotkey right now at this point, right click like where that overlord is outside the base and then quickly box these guys at the front as they start running back towards the natural and, and bring them back up into the main and put them on like, you know, control group four or five or three or whatever, you know, a different control group essentially. And then you just let those other guys just mass up at the front, morph more banelings. And then you can bring those in, click the banelings to blow up the spine crawler. If four banelings blow up on it all at once, there's no chance to transfuse because they do 80 damage a piece, spine 300 hit points, you're going to do 320 damage. But if you go in one baneling at a time or something, a couple transfusers could land and that spine crawler could just sponge so much damage. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I would go for the queen here in the main straight away, first of all. And then I would try to split two zerglings into the edge of the main to morph some banelings down there. And the other zerglings wouldn't actually try to straight up fight because they're already so wounded and your opponent has so many drones. If you can like fight from the bottom of the gas, that's good. But the moment the drones start surrounding you or getting any decent surface area, I'd just be backing off and like running around the mineral line, running around in circles. Your job there is to say, hey, you've got an emergency. You can't really mine while these guys are in your base. And then the next attack is getting ready at the front and there's two banelings morphing in the corner. And that's what we would do here in this very difficult situation. Um, but like I said, he's building roaches and he's built his roach horn not in the wall so he didn't kill it. So he's, he's made it so hard for you, dude. This is like extreme safe response from your opponent. Um, I don't think he's a hacker. I, I take that back. But I was like, Jesus, he's playing so safe with no scouting and um, makes it really hard for you. So um, you do some really good damage there. But yeah, you can imagine if your lings were banking up at the front and then you take the moment to go do an inject. Let's see if we do an inject at all in this chaos. Oh, and then these roaches barely escape, unfortunately, I think. Or transfusers. Oh, so sick with the transfusers. Well played, Kyan. Your opponent did a such a solid build order, dude, in terms of being like just, I will not die to anything. I saw a baneling nest. I'm going to build that third Evo in the wall. I'll build a spine for safety. Really good safety adjustments from your opponent. Um, you know what? I went through all those details of the queen stuff. I think we can make a general rule, dude. If... Uh, there's Zerglings coming across. You can probably just make two extra Zerglings to help your Queens block the scout as well, right? Because if you had two Zerglings with the Queen, it's going to make it infinitely easier than all that fancy Queen shuffling micro shit I talked about. So if this happens a lot more, I'm not saying this is high priority because I really don't think many players will scout for the Banely Nest and, and you know, react as well as Kyan did. Um, nor does a Banely Nest necessarily even mean that because it's a rather normal thing. But... Uh, just one of those things that, you know, if this keeps happening, people are scouting the Banely Nest, responding with extreme safety. Definitely something to focus on. Dude, you're doing so enough damage that it's like, you know, you're, you're almost you're almost breaking through. But uh, yeah, the spine crawler obviously is that, that anchor at the front and it's just taking everything to dick town. And now that there's roaches out and queens, your opponent's kept up a, a roughly equal work account, still droning, making roach speed. We probably should be dead. I love that you're still trying to break him. I think that's the right call. Just keep going. The dogged determination here, the fact that you've actually spent your injects, oh, I'm loving it, mate. At this point, though, you need to stop rallying in because once they get an anchor up, you need to go in with overwhelming force, especially if there's no banelings, right? Whenever they get roaches up, spines, gather up a bigger force, go in all at once, right? 
So wait for the other reinforce, get maybe eight banelings here, and then run in with 30 zerglings, eight banelings. And if he's caught still droning a bit too much, maybe you break him. Now we can see the production tab. We know he would have six more roaches and it wouldn't work, but we there's a chance that that's not happening. We don't know in the heat of the moment that he's building roaches. He could just be re-droning. And, you know, we might that might work, right? Whereas, Whereas this will never work because once they've got a few roaches and a spine up, we're running in four banelings, eight zerglings at a time. There's just no way we can get in. Obviously, he's already held it. We're talking about splitting hairs in terms of how to give us a win percentage in a terrible situation anyway. But really well played, dude. I'm really happy with what you did here. Very good. Okay. Um, so, I, oh, Okay, that's okay. Yeah, we spent a little bit more time on this one <laughs> than perhaps um, I was planning no, to. That's yeah, that's cool. yeah. Um, any last so questions, any questions, questions open to mind? mind? Yeah, just let me let me just take a look at my notes real quick. I will as well. Actually, not really. I, I don't really have to. Like, what would be the next step? Briefly, I know last time we talked about the next step. I just kind of rewatched the the stream and the lessons. Um, was like to go back, make another round of, of roaches and then like drop a roach war and then go in with like Ling Bang type of stuff. I feel I feel like I'd really like to switch to perhaps the my Protoss timing just to kind of go over that really quick. No worries. Instead no worries. of focusing yeah. more on the next step of the Ling Bang, I feel like there's still some more practice there. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. dude. You, you can take this to the moon. This this build, the way you're doing it, you can take it to the moon. And I mean, I know it was only game four we looked at, but your Ling Bane micro can always use work. And even little niche scenarios like this, like I said, getting that habit of like, oh, tell your guys to rally at the front, manually control the guys inside the main to be fuckers while you're re-rallying at the front. Bam, that's a set play we've got to work on. Microing yeah. our Ling Bane versus Ling Bane, stuff to work on. Last question that you had wrote. When you build overlords, do you manually rally or do you let the hatchery rally? So I almost always manually rally them in the heat of the moment, whatever, they just go to the rally point, okay? Early game, first five overlords, click them on the minimap. Past that, I'll build more, I, I build three, four overlords, click them in the back. Build three, four overlords, click them in the back, that sort of thing. But it's not no. the end of the world if they just go to the rally point. Um, that's, that's what I do. I build overlords and I click in the rear. Beautiful. Um, in the back, gosh. Yeah, in the back once you're building big numbers. Why do we change the rally? It's just to make sure because there will be times where you're so busy manually microing some units at the front that you've boxed or something like that. Especially the more you're the more you're box controlling, the more you get into advanced micro, the more you haven't given your eggs in order to come across the map for a while. So you might just realize you've got a bunch of zerglings at home. And it's also if we do, as you said, we we will we will miss control group eggs sometimes. So it's good to have the rally point on the aggressive side of the map. So at least those units are gonna pull up under your overlord outside their base or something like that, rather than, oh, they're sitting next to my natural. And cause I'm so busy, I never even noticed them. You know, maybe maybe you go back to inject and you realize they're there, but usually your rally points in front of your hatchery. So you might not even realize there's 20 zerglings sitting outside your natural the whole time in a nail biter. Gotcha, okay. Beautiful. All right, mate, let's, uh, let's go over to ZVP, shall we? Sure. So for this one, um, I took a look at like my last five, six or so games against Protoss, and uh, I noticed I noticed the pattern. Most of them, actually all of them, were opening the Stargate opening into some sort of ground play. And I noticed that, so I'm just going to kind of go through my thought process. Let me know if I'm like my thinking is kind of correct here. I kind of just took um, just five, six, seven, eight minute drone counts and like army counts just to kind of see what was going on. And I noticed that before like seven to eight minutes, the Protoss has very few units. They're just droning and they got like five ground units and maybe two or three air units. So I figured mm -hmm. a nice timing could hit somewhere around between seven and eight minutes. I figured, okay, okay I can max on, I can get three, three base uh, drone saturation and then yeah. do with like plus one, plus one roaches with speed before mm -hmm. eight minutes on a nice little max and and just see what that happens and then drone right afterwards. So that was kind of my idea. Um, I was practicing this with uh, with Drac the other day and his, his Protoss is, I think maybe, uh, it just feels a little bit lower than where my Zerg is right now. But yeah. uh, the, the point that I was trying to, uh, to get was just try to harass me as much as possible and try to screw me off my build because I wanted to try to do this under pressure. Um, what did I got? Game number three. So this is this is the timing that I came up with. If it's going to hit at eight minutes, the the plus one takes 
117 seconds if we want to be exact, but roughly two minutes. Just make me the so, uh, lobby host before we forget. Okay, awesome. All good. So I figured, okay, eight minutes. That means the upgrades have to start at six minutes, which means the Evos have to be dropped at 5:30, and then 5:30. Yeah. That's kind of the that's kind of the the timing portion of this, and you'll see it's it's down a little bit the ZVP timing evaluation in the document. And then I'll just yeah. have my internal macro clock or macro benchmark of at six minutes. Ideally, I want 66 drones, five hatcheries, and eight queens. Beautiful. So that's kind of what I'm what I was thinking. Of. I, I love that you backtrack the timer. Evos there because one of the dangers of going for a one one timing um, is you're waiting for two upgrades, right? And against a Protoss player, like you said, they might have a few units and then suddenly they have a lot of units because of the way Protoss naturally powers and, and tries to be greedy and then explode into units, right? So that's why the fact that you said, hey, hey, I can't just throw these Evos whenever, right? That, that's maybe a bit more okay if you're being defensive, right? It's like, just focus on your economy and throw the Evos whenever you can afford them. That's fine. Um, definitely would have been a thing. So I think that's... um. That's going to be uh, be really cool. Um, you said you're going melee and plus one range, is it? Yeah, so for this for this game, this was the game I got some feedback. I was like, well, you have a lot of Zerglings along with this as well. Like, we noticed this pattern. And he said, okay, we'll try to go double attack upgrades instead of with the Carapace, because by that time I've got, like, Immortals and, mm -hmm. you know, Stalkers. They didn't really care about the extra plus one armor. So... And you've okay. Got yeah. At that point, it makes sense to just go with a melee. So I just you're doing that. you're doing like a pack of roaches, some ravages, and a good number of zerglings as well. Yeah, and that's so. The funny thing is that's that's awesome, right? The problem is if you run into zealot archon, those lings are literally worthless doing an attack, especially if they've got a shield battery. If they've got say ten zealots out with charge and two archons, those zerglings are worthless. If they've still just got a few mortals and sentries and stuff and stalkers, the zerglings are absolutely worth their weight in gold. Just something to keep in mind. Um, so against the Zealot Archon, we'd actually be much better off with a Carapace upgrade and being pure Roach Ravager. Just keep that in mind. So that's like a little note we can kind of... The, the Zergling thing was not... Um, yeah. my, my original idea was just to go Roach Ravager. The Zerglings just kind of came in as more like a, a filler. So if, I, if I'm just... Not if I don't have enough gas to make the road trip the ravager count that I want, which is like, like around like nine, eight to ten or so. Um, then if I'm floating a lot of money, then I'll just make a round of slings because it's like I still want a lot of army to go and attack. And if I do see archons, I'm probably not going to go ahead and fight with the direct thing. I'll probably just split those links off, fight with the yeah. road ravager, and see if I can do a backstab with the links. Do a backstab with the links, perfect. I'm writing that in the document as you're saying it. Beautiful, dude. Well done, well done. <laughs> All right, so uh, I've only played this for like five games, so this is still like a work in progress, but at no least a homework assignment. Well, I love that Drax being a dickhead and just making your life hard here. So he's trying to disrupt your build order, and that's kind of you know it's good practice because it's like, hey, can you find your way back um, to the proper? Yeah, he, he kind of played the player on this one because he put a pile on at the third, which is not normally something anyone would do, but. He, he so, knew I liked that third, so he just planted it there. And I was like, oh, man, you cheeky bastard. <laughs> Super meta, right? Super meta. Now, I think just a small adjustment here. You could have dropped your spawning pool while heading to the other third. So at this point, where your third's been delayed and then it's been delayed again, at this point, a snap call would have been really cool. Click it to the other base, chuck your spawning pool down, maybe build one more drone, and then put the third hatch down. Because if we look at your minerals, like that should line up. So just it, it, the general rule is just like, hey... If they're being a mega dickhead, do that. Because you can see here, a spawning pool is 200 minerals, right? And you've just built a gas, which is 25, 25 minerals, right? So if, if you went like gas pool or just the pool or whatever it is, right? And then this hatchery still would have gone down at the exact same time. So just a nice little rule in case we do get like double blocked. Yeah, this is my first instance of ever getting double blocked. If I get single yeah. blocked, I'll just build another drone and throw on the hatchery. And I'm, I'm usually okay absorbing that. This is my first instance of the double drop, so I'll keep so that in mind. Do you want to go gas period. pool or, or just spawning pool there if, if you if you do see the double block while you move over to the new hatchery? What, what do you uh, want? I'll probably, just, I'll probably just gas pool just to kind of keep the order yep. going. Keep the same order. So we'll go gas plus pool plus one to two drones. All right. While, you know, while waiting for a drone to traverse, right? Over to the new hatchery location. That's important because that just needs to be a bit of muscle memory, right? Because these disruptive situations, we just want to have that, take the decision out of it, be a little be a little uh, more efficient. Now, you did okay. Your hatchery is obviously very delayed. 
it sucks that your, your pool's delayed because if, if your pool's coming out, it at least speeds up your queen, right? And it, it just gets the, the ball rolling a little bit quicker. This doesn't massively screw your build up in general. You're still building lava, you're still building your gas and then your pool after your hatch. So overall, pretty good. But if we have that muscle memory next time, you squeeze the pool in earlier. It's just your queen, your first queen and your main comes out earlier. Obviously you need to build an earlier overlord for that as well, but it, it, it just will make things flow a little, a little nicer. So, um, Anyways, let's let's take a look at how we play here. We can fast forward the early game a little bit. We've got one queen on the way, two zerglings. Second queen starts immediately. Ling speed, pulling off gas, transferring drones to the third. Really nice play so far. Let's clear up that pylon. We're going to take this hatchery. Beautiful, right on about 33 supply. We have one extra overlord, which is normally inefficient. In this case, I'm all about it because it's a messy macro situation, isn't it? Uh, everything's a little bit little bit different after this disruption. But I would argue you're coming out on top. Drakek tried to be a dickhead and you've not been thrown off your build order. His build order is actually the one that's been messed up because that slowed down his Nexus. His Cybercore, his Stargate is about a, a minute, uh, maybe let's say 45 seconds later than it could have been. Um, 40, 45 seconds. So... At the end of this, the power of just staying focused on your goals, you're looking really good. Well played. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think his, his focus wasn't too much on his build. I just said focus more on just trying to throw me off. So I, I wouldn't bug him too much about it because his focus we're, was we're more on we're, we're, It's all right, Drakek. <laughs> it's all right, Drakek. Yeah, I know you can do okay. better. Sure, buddy. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, um, He's a cool big, big shout out to helping, helping me out there. Yeah, oh, it makes such a big difference just to get some reps down, doesn't it, in, in custom games. So we do have a bit of a supply block here. Luckily, your hatchery finished, so it brought you out of that, um, which I guess we're, we're probably kind of used to that hatchery finishing even a little bit earlier. We're going to build a spore on each base, which <clears throat> we could argue we could be greedy and, and not build it because, you know, if we've seen a void ray, who knows, might not, might not even build an oracle, right? Um, especially if you're building so many queens. So definitely an advanced thing to work on, which I wouldn't advise right now, but something for the future. If we feel like Protoss players are generally getting ahead of us, just leave two queens in each mineral line. Say if you've got two in the main, two in the third, you just build a spore in the natural. And that's the one base you don't care about leaving queens in basically. That's something I'm working on right now. Um, so it, it hasn't yet mati uh, materialized into my play yet, but that is something I'm experimenting with now. For, for now, I'm just remembering Winter's rule of spore 20 and forget about everything else what's spore 20 spores at 420 <laughs> oh 420 okay cool is that just first protoss or versus everyone uh this is generally against terran but if i do scout the early um the early starport and i see an oracle building i'll drop it down at like 330 um okay. but if i see like a void ray first normally i would delay that to maybe like 445 maybe even five minutes or so okay cool cool so our droning does slow down. So this is the main concern why I'm rewinding here is because you are so focused on getting like your evos and stuff that you can see we are floating like a lot of lava here. Now, if you need to get your upgrades, you need to get your upgrades for your timing. So it's actually kind of okay. It's just something we want to be aware of is the fact that like, hey, we are building, you know, seven queens right now. It's a lot of queens. It's part of why we're so mineral starved, right? So maybe that seventh queen, that eighth queen, really not necessary unless we actually see multiple void rays because even if they come across with two or three void rays about this time if you've got six queens <clears throat> three queens will beat that right and you can always bring a fourth or fifth queen you know off these hatcheries if you need it um and, and then start building more queens but i would just be a little hesitant around building eight queens every game by default because more and more with the patch we are going to see more people play stargate into ground or straight ground and i've been running into uh, players in bronze to gm playing protoss and like everyone's just building 10 queens by default and you know they're getting annihilated by ground transitions and ground timings because those queens are just completely unnecessary right they're just not really the most useful unit now don't get me wrong right now it's a pretty good set piece but we can scale it back just a little bit potentially and that would allow you to keep that lava drone machine rolling just a little bit smoother so what do you what do you feel about that maybe stop at six queens just as a default and at then maybe queens? build more if you need it at, at how many queens six queens total <clears throat> I can, yeah, I can do that. I feel good about that actually, because that is something I notice. If if I'm just doing like a, just a macro warm up, just in a game like Easy AI, then I can get to 66 drones by maybe even as early as like 5:30. But 
you do bring up a good point. I hadn't even considered it of the, the queen count um, eating into my minerals that should be allocated for drones. Because I, I did yeah. notice that my droning is feels a little slower and I wasn't able to kind of figure out why. Yeah, I mean, you, you're rushing your evos and your gases to make sure you can get the upgrades and into the roach production, which is good because you, you've kind of adjusted your gas timing. This is not, like I said, just a purely I'm sitting back and just trying to get my drones up as quickly as possible. You've focused on the upgrades and that's giving you a crisp timing, which is what I'm very impressed by. It does come at a cost a little bit, but if we can scale back even one of those queens, three more drones, right? Um, two queens, maybe you stop at five queens, that's six more drones, right? So it, it's up to you. I... If I'm playing someone who's playing pure ground, and if they don't have a warp prism, dude, I'm gonna stop it like literally three or four queens. Like I'm just like I, I got two, two or three creep tumors out, and that creep queen now becomes my third injecting queen. We're good. I just want more drones and 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 fighting units and stuff. And obviously, if there's an archon drop running around, I get a little bit more antsy with it. I'm like, all right, build two more queens, deal with this archon drop, you know, um, go up to five or six. If there's you know multiple void rays coming in, but definitely just something to keep in mind that you can do, especially since you're building safety spores as well. So let's just say six queens for now. We can potentially make it five in the future as well. Now, as it is, you've gone to six gas. You did end up with the macro hatch and the fourth base. We should not really need a macro hatchery with this build. However, uh, so is this something you do every game or was this more just to like, hey, I'm floating some money. Let's chuck a macro hatch down, keep the machine rolling. Yeah, kind of both. Um, if I'm floating a heck of a lot of money, I'll throw a fourth, fifth, and a macro hatch. But generally, I'll throw um, a, a fourth and a macro hatch. Sometimes I'll throw a fourth and a fifth if I'm feeling like there's no harassment coming down. Yeah. But yeah. So it's, I think it's it... not generally the best play. I try to go for like a rule of one gas, try to build the extra couple of hatcheries, and then start the gas explosion and then take more hatcheries from there. Let's just, yeah, just if you're playing Roach Hydra styles in general, don't need macro hatcheries if we play a really clean build order. Like I said, if you ever end up just floating money and it's just like, hey, shit, let's get on top of it. Always good to build a macro hatch, right? But if you hit your build really tight, the goal should be, hey, I'm playing a Roach style, dude. That fourth base is like already excess production at this point, right? That's already, That's already kind of super huge and more than I need, essentially. And um, curious, with a macro hatch in, in the main... Yeah, um, yeah. Do you inject that as well, or do you just leave it the hell alone? Because I can no. inject four hatcheries perfectly fine. If I like, if if I have such a high queen count, I'll just take one of them, throw it in the main, and then I'll just inject four hatcheries from then on. I can do that. Um, I no, haven't gotten no. the habit of doing it, but I'm just wondering your opinion. I wouldn't advise it, actually. Um, so something I started just doing in like my ZVT, and I'll probably do it in all my matchups, is rather than the double hatch in the main like Dark does where he just literally grabs all of his queens at some point and just starts queuing injects across every hatchery. Like he just goes to his main and just queues injects on all three hatcheries because he uses camera locations. And at some point he gets lazy and just puts every queen on one control group. And he's like, ah, oh, I'll queue up like eight injects or 15 injects across these three hatcheries in my main. That's easy. But it's not. And his injects effing suck under pressure. Um, I love criticizing Dark because he's literally the best player in the world in so many regards. Like I... I absolutely admire his play, but he's riddled with inefficiency. Um, it's much better to put that hatchery out here at your third or in between your third and your fourth, third and your natural, something like that, because then your queens are always nearby. So that pops up and you can just be like, oh, dump a bunch of injects into it, dump a bunch of injects into the fourth base and the macro hatch at the same time. Voila, they're both going to produce. And that way you don't need to add anything to your system. You can still just be injecting off three hatcheries all game, but there's a one-time take those creep queens, dump some extra injects into them, they're going to turn into the automatically producing lava fountains. That's interesting. I never considered a macro hatch at like the fourth or fifth base location. Yeah, not fourth or fifth, probably like in between the third and the natural somewhere is, is pretty good. Obviously, this map's a bit funny because it's kind of in between the third and the fourth, I guess. Um, but yeah, somewhere in, out in the middle area because it's rare that it's going to go down there. Obviously, try not to create like a wall off with it that they're going to use as part of their push. <laughs> it can be annoying, but uh, that way it's rallying closer to the front and it's just closer to those creep queens, which they always have an excess of energy at a certain point in the game, right? So whereas getting a queen all the way back up at the main, it's just a long way for a queen to walk in a high pressure game. So I think that's the way to do it. Gotcha. And then as soon as these 10 roaches pop, I think I leave. Yeah. So you're droning behind us. Let's, let's pause for one moment here. In your notes... You've said, I drone, I build a spire and an infestation pit. What's the next plan, though? You don't have one, right? And that's fine, but let's map one out really quickly in your notes. What do we do behind that? Uh, I figured 
Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna add some more tech. So Aspire, because Aspire is always nice against pretty much every matchup. Um, and you know, just in case into a um, what do you call it? A, uh, a carrier transition or a sky toss transition. I want to be prepared. I don't want to get caught my pants down. I like the addition of the um, infestation pit, so I can go for hives for vipers if there's disruptors. Um, so yeah, it's it's mainly just to get to the vipers. Just that way, I can deal with some of the annoying protoss shenaniganry that I see. <laughs> okay, so we're always going to go straight to hive for vipers because that's going to wreck disruptors and colossus, and we can also abduct immortal zarkons. Blinding clouds, good. It's a general, really good complement to a heavy roach army, right? Oh, right. We add hydras or not? Are you going hydras usually after this? Uh, to be quite honest, I don't know. I I, I just thought let's just go to hive because vipers are good, and yep, I just don't yep. want to die to disruptors because I have a lot of trouble with them. I don't really have a follow-up on this one. I was just, let's just get this timing done. I'll kind of wing it from there. <laughs> but I don't really have well, a plan well, afterwards. I haven't kind of thought that. Thought there's of that. there's <laughs> two ways we can do it. We can add the Hydras to round out this meaty ranged army, add Vipers and just be like, it's just Roach Hydra Viper, possibly adding Lurkers. Or we can do the way you're doing it, but go, okay, we'll, we'll still go the infestation for the Hive to get Vipers. And um, if they have air, we'll go Corruptors. Otherwise we go to Brewlord. So it's just Roach Ravager, Viper, you know, Corruptors are only an option versus air into a Broodlord swap and you just do a big Broodlord push with like Mass Roach Ravager and like 10 Broods if it's pure ground. Yeah, that's actually, thank you for reminding me, that's actually what my original plan was. If I if I see a Robo and it's pure ground army, I want to go Broodlords because they just completely trash over anything Protoss ground. The only thing is I never know how much to make and you just answered that 10 Broodlords, I think? You yeah, I mean, that. whatever you can get. Basically, the idea is, and, and especially if they're very turtled up, if you could be greedy and morph them halfway across the map, that's good because they're very slow because it really is a timing attack. It's like, hey, hopefully they don't see this at all. Bam, morph them. Bam, you've got Broodlords sieging their base and you just keep your Roach Ravager under the Broodlords but not running in front of the Broodlords. Uh, too many players basically let their Broodlords all hit a gateway while the whole ground army runs past, chases the Protoss army in dies piece by piece in the batteries and the cannons on its own, and then they can deal with the Broodlords on their own. The Broodlords are such a pain in the ass for them to deal with. They're your siege tank. They're your ranged unit that forces them to come to you. And if your opponent's blinking into Mass Roach Ravager, you know, you're not trying to run Archons and High Templar and whatever else into Mass Roach Ravager, it doesn't go too well for them. Whereas we know what happens when we run into their storms and their Archons and their shield batteries and stuff like that. So the Broodlord is going to really be just an absolute destroyer of any Protoss ground army, okay? Yeah. Okay, so and yeah. I guess are these broods like not going home? They're there to just push, 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 and then the roach ravagers that are kind of to basically provide cover. Like if they start coming to the broods, it's like get away from me, throw yeah. a couple of yeah. defensive vials. Yeah, yeah. I, ideally they just try and fight you, and you're like, cool, I can just a move my roach ravager, and and the broodlords always get their own control group because you want to start a step backwards because broodlords shoot very slowly, but they only need to turn around for like a fraction of a second to shoot. So they're like a unit that should spend 80% of their time running away from the opponent during a battle and like 20% turn, throw a brood, throw a broodling, keep running, turn, throw a broodling. And that way like Archons and Stalkers and stuff can't really get underneath them. Um, so that's something like you'll see a lot of noobs just throw their whole army on an F2 and they just A move it. And like either, like I said, the Roach Ravager runs way in front or the Broodlords go too far forward and they like just have an easy blink forward and focus them all down kind of thing. And you're like, oh. Whereas if you start to step them back, they can't really get hit by Storm at all um you know the stalkers will blink and kill one and then they're out of range of the stalkers and the stalkers are all surrounded by broodlings and roaches and dying and like, is this a general one. rule for, for broodlords i was not aware that they were supposed to be micro absolutely yeah so this is this is like the thing where like everyone's like broodlords aren't good man and i'm like it's kind of like I'm, they don't say that as much as about ultras but it's like yeah it's it's actually really funny so when you're when you're leveling up in the ladder i'm always like broodlords are like the best unit ever but until you're playing mid GMs, most players don't know how to put them on their own control group. So their Broodlord micro is just absolutely appallingly bad. It's uh, gotcha. really, really bad. So this is why people like, man, Broodlords, like sometimes players are like, Broodlords are Imber. And I'm like, trust me, your opponent's incompetent. Just like fall back and bait their army in front because they're just going to A move. And then you can fight the Zerg army piece by piece. And then you deal with the Broodlords where there's no support left. <laughs> And they're like, oh, it's not going to work. And I'm like, trust me, guys. I did this so many thousands of times on the ladder winning, you know, games I had no business winning where they, uh, they the Zerg doesn't keep their army together and organize it, you know. So definitely something to, to keep in mind there is uh, it's, it's massive. The micro on the Broodlords is absolutely game changing. Um, there was a period where pros weren't doing it. And I was like always triggered, man. I'd just be like, 
you know, you'd see Snoot just like, Micro, you brood lords, why do they not have their own control group? God damn it. Ah. Um, but people have figured it out in this year. Everyone's everyone's very good at late game these days. Okay. Do you also do this against, this is a side question, but do you also do this against, let's say, like really turtly Terrans? Like when you're engaging a really siege up position, you like throw around a brood lords, kind of back off just a little bit, just in case if they push with like ghosts and other chasing units. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. If you just aim move them, they naturally kind of spread out and they can just like pick off four brood lords on the edge. Um, or, or, you know, they, they filter away and stuff. Whereas you move in, you move out, you move in, you move out. And especially if it's like, oh, there's five Thors there. You just can't fight Thors with brood lords because brood lords, uh, Thors have crazy anti air range, massive uh, bonus damage to massive. Ghosts can snipe them, so you move in, you move out a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, there are periods where, look, my opponent just doesn't have anything that shoots up, I can just A-move, right? There are times where that's the case. But even then, like, Marines can dick Broodlords really hard, right? I've seen people just lose, like, a lot of Broodlords just because they don't micro them. The Marines just stim forward and focus fire the Broodlords down. And you'd be amazed, like, almost any unit with a bit of forward stutter step and focus fire up, like even Hydras, all efficient versus Broodlords if the Broodlords aren't micro. So something to keep in mind. The other thing is melee upgrades are absolutely crucial. So you have to start adding melee upgrades because Broodlings provide most of their damage. And a Broodling does four damage, one less than a Zergling. So every plus one attack on that is like a huge, massive, massive percentage boost, right? It's actually massive. So air upgrades don't really matter for Broodlords. It's all about the Broodling attack upgrades, most importantly. I've seen people make many... Yep, sorry, continue. Uh, I was just going to do the air upgrades affect... I probably should know this, though. Do the air upgrades affect at least the initial... They do, um, yeah. But it only okay. does 20 damage. So at base, it's like 20, 22, 24, 26. And it shoots so slowly that that's almost meaningless. Um, so don't get me wrong. The longer the game goes, the richer you are, the more like, hey, we might as well get those air upgrades. Obviously, you need air upgrades for Corruptors and whatnot anyway. Um, but if it's just Broodlords and Roaches, so you just added a brown, it's like, make sure you have at least plus one melee. Luckily, Protoss players don't build a lot of armor upgrades. Um, but if you are playing against the rare Double Forge boy, well, holy shit, dude. If they have like plus two armor on their Stalkers, your Broodlings are doing one damage a hit. And you're like, why aren't these Stalkers dying, man? <laughs> Whereas you have the plus two Broodlings, Oh, they're doing three damage a hit to the, or, or four damage a hit to, no, three damage because of the, the base armor, which is way more, way more. Um, so it makes a huge, huge difference in terms of, uh, of that. So a general rule I have when I'm playing these sort of styles is I usually probably wouldn't ever go plus three range, um, but it depends how committed you are or how the game flow is, right? When those upgrades finish. But as a general, rule, usually I will swap to melee carapace after plus two range because in the late game, I'm swapping to more like broodlords, more zerglings with adrenal glands, ultralisks potentially become more of the core of my army in late game versus uh, Protoss. So that's my general rule. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, this is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Don't leave this replay. Let's keep looking at this this fight, which is pretty nice. And by the way, the, the mutas were not my standard follow-up. Normally I would try to go for corruptors and then eventually more of them the broodlords. I just this was just a gameplay decision. I was like, oh, he doesn't have anything, so let me just get the mutas to seal the deal. Absolutely. So that was a bit of deviation from my plan. No, that makes sense. Um if we think about it, maybe we just go plus two range and plus one melee so that we can then after plus two range, that swaps to plus two carapace. And so we can go plus two melee, plus two carapace at the same time after plus two range is done. Does that make sense? Um, say that again. Sorry, I got confused with the upgrades. Um, actually, wait so, a minute. Before, before that, let me ask the last one question. With this yeah. push, should I normally go with the double upgraded, the, 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 the double attack upgrades, or should I go with the range plus the carapace? And then the follow up would be what are the next kind of upgrade patterns from there? Well, I, I like what you did here. Just range carapace is good because the carapace does help a lot for our sellets. Um, it's not massive versus mortals and archons, but it's great versus the zealots and stalkers. So um, I'm down with range carapace to start. Okay, cool. So what we'll do is you're going to go range carapace. I'm writing this over in the notes. Then you're going to go plus two range, plus one melee. And then you're going to go two, two melee carapace. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. And then you're going to have sick adrenal zergling ultras that you can potentially go to but more importantly it's just you got two two broodlings awesome they're gonna kick ass um so the other thing here is i want to look at your camera in this fight quickly uh, hold on to that question okay hold, uh, actually you know you shoot I, I'll, I'll remember what i'm gonna say oh no, no, no I've, I've got this i've had this question for a while keep going okay 
Uh, you keep looking at home during the fight. Really nice to keep doing things, but to me it speaks of disorganization in the next step. I'm watching your camera. Let's go home and build gases. Let's look back at the front. Let's go home and build a spire. Let's look back at the front. Let's build, go home and build an infestation. Let's go home. I don't like this at all. Now, why? There could be disruptors. There could be storms. Uh, in general, you've got 600 minerals before you go in. Just effing do it then. <laughs> it's nice that you're droning and stuff, but like we can drone while looking at the fight without looking at home. And I'm totally happy for you to miss injects while you're controlling this fight, okay? As, as bad as that normally is in this scenario, you spend eight minutes, eight and a half minutes building this attack. Let's bloody micro this attack, okay? Let's Because we really need to kill their army right now. If we can kill their economy, that's good as well. But the army is always the goal with any attack versus Protoss because we don't want to let them build up Storm, Arc, or Immortal, Colossus, Disruptor, Carrier, Void, you know, we don't want to let them centralize their massive power. You run into a Colossus, a High Templar, an Archon, and an Immortal, you laugh at it. You run into six Immortals, three Colossus, four High Templar with Storm, three Archons, you shit your fucking pants as a Zerg, right? You're like, ah, ah. So getting rid of the army is always the goal. Trying to get on top and kill that army if possible. Often we go for the economy to force them to come out and fight us, obviously, if they're in like a corner or something where we can't really get on them. So when you go okay. for this attack, you see you've got the Spire Infestation Pit, start more upgrades, etc. What are we going to write? Fire, spire Infestation Pit plus fourth base gases. I'm so this, this should be done like, like my army moves out and then as it's moving out, then drop those things and yeah. then we engage and then, okay. And because you don't need to look at home to drone. So let's drop Spire Infestation Pit, fourth base gases at this point or even a few seconds earlier where we are in the replay. And then as the fighting's happening, you can build a big round of drones. And then as the fight washes up, then we can go home, inject, build a round of drones, start the hive as well when we jump home because the infestation pit will be done, right? So that's even mapped out, isn't it? So as soon as you jump home, hive for vipers and... Um, and uh, yeah, we, we can get like two, two upgrades or whatever, or one, two upgrades, one, two upgrades. We can um, drone the fourth or, or make sure the drones on the fourth go on the gases if because we have probably, we've probably just let the rally point take them there up to that point, right? So they're all just sitting on the fourth. So we're like, oh yeah, doop, 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 do that. Um, you're always going to be transferring drones from your main around this time as well, aren't you? So yeah. beautiful. And then I want you to tunnel vision on this attack, right? Because you are asking even about Storm and stuff. But anyway, so that's enough for now. Um, what were you going to ask? Uh, I was just going to ask, uh, like, how how far up... Well, this is probably a stupid question. I'm thinking about it. Uh, how far up the ladder is Mutaling Bane a viable strategy against Sky Toss? In the sense that you have Mutaling Bane, you run into their economy. I tried this out. You, you suggested the idea of doing Mutaling Bane, never mm -hmm. fighting the army, killing their economy, forcing them to do a base trade, and then you win in the base trade. And it's gotten me a lot of success. It's a lot of fun. It's very it's powerful. Very you know, I, I, can, I do it as well. Honestly, there's games... Like, I've been trying to focus more on if I have a good opening... Um, try to just fight with Muta Corruptor and I delay the like melee upgrades in the Bailing Nest and stuff a long time while trying to just get up to six base gas and just really fight with Muta Corruptor. Um, I lost EPT this week by not being decisive. Well, I got oh, a greedy with my first Mutas and my opponent killed them all with uh, Phoenix because I went in a bit too deep picking off some probes and that was really bad because that was like right when my Corruptors and Mutas were coming out. So if I'd kept those alive, I would have been good. And then I was too afraid with my next timing of maxed out Muta Corruptor. The whole point is I'm not doing as many Baneling run buys and Ling run buys because I'm focusing on killing the army because the more optimal the play is, the more you've got to stop that Protoss army building up. However, what I know I would have more success with, except when I'm playing the 6K plus Protoss players, really, like the really, really good Protoss players are all quite high GM. I know if I just made more Ling Bane, I'd probably be more successful because it's just, it's like more constant risk-free aggression where you're just clicking things into mineral lines from all sides. And I know that's like a strength of mine and it's something a lot of Sky Toss players suck against because they can't F2 their army. Like they've got to split it and that's really hard. Their brains usually melt a little bit. Ah, a bit of an aneurysm. Um, uh, obviously jokes aside, it, it is seriously something where it's just it's just waves of Ling here. Bane's there, Muta's in the main. It, it's just harder because they're just dealing with more prongs. Whereas just using one squad of Muta Corruptor and like, picking your fights is much more it's a bit more technical about picking when to engage and trying to like 
oh, there's a void ray exposed, pick it off, run away, that sort of thing. Oh, find an angle, pick off three probes, when to commit, when not to commit. It's a bit more knowledge, whereas the Ling Bane can be a bit more haphazard where you're just like, roll it in, roll it in, roll it in. You know, it's just never stop, never stop. Oh, cool, I have 85 workers and now I can just make like 30 muters at once and actually like just jump on these void rays. Awesome, you know? Okay, cool. That, that makes sense. I'll, I'll stick with this then because I want to try to learn more on how to fight the Protoss army because that's definitely a weakness of mine. And then maybe like... Uh, next session we can kind of work on some ZVT stuff because that it used to feel like my strongest matchup but now that I have plans for the other two matchups it definitely feels like my my weakest now <laughs> awesome mate I think you're doing really good though in, in you know you've, you've worked on this timing attack simply by having that that plan for the next step as well with the if it's just ground we're just adding vipers and it's just hey round two of Roach Ravager with vipers come in right and then you've got your broodlords preparing behind that as like almost round three right because especially if it's like Stalker Colossus, dude, Roach Ravager Viper ruins it. You just abduct all the big units and it's just Stalkers then. Um, feels so good if you can if you can pull that off. So we can think of that as there's a second attack now and then a third attack with the Broodlords first ground versus air. It's just going to be Roach Ravager and then Corruptors Viper coming out. Obviously Parasitic Bombs versus Void Rays. Otherwise trying to use abducts where we can. If you can take the fight just diving on top and shift clicking carriers or, or whatnot is uh, pretty nice so yeah dude um pretty good economy build up definitely enjoying it um shout out to dracx for trying to disrupt you if dracx watching dracx stop building stalkers mate you could uh could have given mr oak a much harder time if we weren't building stalkers here <laughs> it's the, awesome well the thank you so much for the for the tips and uh, i'll keep my eyes open for a good terran timing if i can figure one out and uh, yeah, I look I look forward to uh, to showing off a much more tightly executed um, Protoss timing, hopefully on the ladder. Heck yeah, dude. No, really well played. Very impressive. The attention to detail with the Zerg versus Zerg, the ZVP as well. So uh, you're definitely on that improvement road right now. Keep it up, dude. Awesome. Thanks so much. Take care. All right. All right. Catch you next Catch time. You. Have a good one. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Um, are we going to... Are we going to set up the next time right now or we're going to do this? That's a good That's idea. A good. <laughs> that seems like a thing smart people do. Uh, do you want to do the same time next week if it's available? Uh, let me check the calendar. Yeah, I'm free. Let's do it. All right, it's on, mate. Very good. We'll see you then. All right, mate. See you then. Good night. Cheers. Beautiful.